Chapter 7, How Penny Broke Jail When Penny saw the pollywog gripping the bars of his cell and staring out at her, she almost cried with joy. The pollywog, in his turn, began to jump up and down, crowing with delight. The green man with the sheriff's badge put a very large key into a very large and rusty lock, swung open the barred door and motioned to Penny to go in. She did so, and in a moment was hugging the pollywog. She heard the door clang behind her, and only then realized that she, too, was locked securely in a jail cell. The green sheriff hung the key on a nail in the wall. Then he put his hat down lower over his nose, slumped down in a chair, picked a comic book from a pile that lay beside it, and settled down to read. Penny put the pollywog down and peeped out through the bars to try and find exactly what he was reading. Why, she said, it's a Wyatt Earp comic, and there's a mad monster at the top of the pile. Now Penny began to think of all the familiar things that she had seen in the stalls, and the green man dressed like a pretend sheriff, and the comic books in the pile. They must come up through holes in the ground and steal things that people up above leave lying around, Penny said to herself. The more she thought about it, the more it made sense. She had noticed more than once that if you left something lying around, it was liable to disappear forever. Father, for instance, was always complaining that somebody had stolen one of his tools, and she could still hear her mother saying, now, now, dear, it couldn't have got up and walked away. If you just didn't leave your things lying around, you wouldn't misplace them. Penny thought of the tiny saw, which had made such a neat trap door in the floor of the playhouse, and she made a mental note to be more careful of her own things in the future. Og, said the pollywog suddenly. The sheriff looked up from his reading. Og, he said absently and turned a page. Og, 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 the pollywog chattered back to him. Why, Polly, Penny exclaimed, you clever little boy, you've actually learned the language. Og, og, said the pollywog smugly. But then it occurred to Penny that the pollywog had always known the language. The only word he ever said was og. In fact, she had noticed him using it to other babies who occasionally visited their home. The two babies would stare at each other for minutes on end, occasionally poking each other in the eye with a rattle and passing the time of day by saying, Og, over and over again. How useful you are, Polly, Penny said. You can be my interpreter. Ask the sheriff what he intends to do with us. Og, shouted the pollywog through the bars. Og, og, said the sheriff, not looking up. Og, og, said the pollywog, brightly to Penny. Penny shook her head sadly. The trouble was, she realized that while the pollywog could talk og language, he couldn't talk hers. Once again, she felt herself very close to tears. Nothing was going right. She and the pollywog were in jail. Earless Osdick was going to be eaten. Goodness knows what had happened to the others. Oh, Polly, she said, we are in a mess. One heck of a mess, muttered a voice. Penny jerked her head around. She could have sworn it came from the direction of the sheriff, but he seemed absorbed in his cowboy comic. He can't understand much of it, thought Penny. But then she noticed a strange thing. As the sheriff peered at each comic page, his lips moved slowly, like a small child learning to read. Penny watched him for a moment in amazement. Then she spoke. Excuse me, she said in a challenging voice. The sheriff slowly put his book down and turned to her. You speaking to me, partner, he said in a slow drawl. Why, he talks cowboy talk, Penny exclaimed in delight. I bet he learns it from the comic books. Then falling quickly into the lingo, she said, 
What do you figure I'm doing with us, Sheriff? Don't rightly know, said the Sheriff. Never had no one in jail afore this. String you up, most likely. Penny shivered at the thought, but her curiosity got the better of her fear. Why don't you speak like this all the time, she asked him. Why do you always speak in, in Oggs? It's easier, said the sheriff, shining his star on his sleeve. Don't take no brain work. He yawned deeply and went back to reading his Wyatt Earp comic, and Penny could get no more out of him. A few minutes later, he dropped his comic book listlessly and drifted off into a deep slumber. He snores just like father, Penny told herself. Hanging suspended just above him, she could see the great key to the cell door dangling. She had read of many situations when good guys held in jail had sneaked a key away from a sleeping sheriff, let themselves out, and gone off in pursuit of bad guys. Indeed, such a situation had occurred in Lucy Lawless, girl wrestler. Lucy had made a lasso out of her two stockings, thrown it over the key, and escaped while the sheriff was still snoring in the jailhouse. Penny thought about that for a while, but realized that she could not duplicate that feat. She wasn't very good with a lasso, and besides, she wasn't wearing any stockings. It occurred to her that a long stick might do the trick, but the cell was quite bare. There was nothing in it that she could use at all. In fact, she realized with a shock, there was no one else in the cell, not even the polywog. Polly, Penny cried, where are you? She heard a little bark and turning about saw him. He was outside the cell on all fours as usual, crawling about in delight at being free. Oh, Polly, Penny cried, you have escaped again. However, do you do it? But the polywog did not tell. For one thing, he couldn't talk. For another, it was a secret. Does Mandrake the magician tell all he knows? Certainly not. Years later, when the polywog tried to remember how he always escaped, he couldn't. By then, his mind was too crowded with other things such as how to work out the square root of 925 and whether or not an agate was a good trade for three smokies. Polly, Penny whispered, the key, get me the key. And she pointed toward the wall above the sheriff. The polywog headed across the floor at a great rate, straight for the sleeping man. Oh, the clever little thing, said Penny. He knows exactly what to do. But the polywog was not interested in the key. It was the pile of comic books on which his beady little eyes were fastened. For most of his life, he had wanted to be alone with a pile of comic books. Often he had stared out from behind the bars of his crib or playpen and watched wistfully while the other children lay on their stomachs on the floor and read Batman, Superman, Heckle and Jekyll and others but the polywog was never allowed to have any. Instead, he was given horrible little books made out of cloth with foolish pictures of balls and blocks and kittens on each page. Nobody ever did anything in these books. There were no pictures of funny men hitting other funny men and going wham or zowie. Only pictures of balls with big bees under them and cows with big C's. Worst of all, from the polywog's point of view, these little books were so strongly constructed that it was quite impossible to tear them to bits. The polywog almost dived into the sheriff's pile of comics. He seized a mad monster and began turning the pages avidly. He could not read a word, but the pictures were very exciting. There was an especially large dog with green eyes and huge nostrils that the polywog liked enormously. This was not actually a dog. It was the mad monster himself, but the polywog didn't know that. He thought that everything that walked on four feet was a dog. He barked at the picture of the mad monster and waited for it to bark back, but nothing happened. So he tore the page out 
and crawled over to the cell and gave it to Penny to look at. Penny was in agony of frustration. Here they were, so near to freedom, and all that little Pollywog thought of was comic books. Look, Polly, she said, very carefully and slowly. You've got to get me that key. See? The key. Up there. And she pointed. The Pollywog crawled back at high speed and seized another comic book. Penny watched him helplessly. What on earth could she do? In a few minutes, the sheriff would wake up or somebody would come and then they would be no better off than before. An idea came to her. Paul, she said in a sharp commanding voice. Don't you dare touch that key. Leave it alone now. The Pollywog dropped his copy of Larry the Ghoul and looked up with sudden interest. You leave that key alone now, Paul, Penny said, again trying her best to sound like her mother. Paul looked up at the key, and his face took on the same look of cunning that it did when his mother told him he mustn't go near the jelly beans. The key was too high for him to reach, but this did not faze him. He hauled himself up on the little stool beside the sheriff, stretched up his hand, and pulled the key down. Can I have a comic book, please, Polly? Penny asked him. She was far too knowing to ask for the key. The Pollywog rolled off the stool and onto the pile of scattered comics. He tore another page out of the mad monster and took it over to Penny. She had no time to be gentle. She seized the baby by his arm and forced the key out of his fist. It was a tough going for he held onto it very firmly. She was glad it was just a key and not an all-day sucker. Otherwise, she knew she'd never have got it away from him. For as everybody knows, the hardest thing in the world is to take candy from a baby. The Pollywog was outraged. Penny could see by the outthrust of his lower lip that he was about to cry. She knew she must move quickly, and she did. She reached through the bars slid the key into the lock, turned it, and flung open the cell door. The Pollywog was so surprised by this that he forgot to cry. Penny reached down and kissed him so he would know they were still friends. Then, keeping him close to her, she began to slide along the far wall past the sleeping sheriff. A thought occurred to her. If the sheriff awoke, they would be at his mercy. There was only one thing to do. She must take his guns away from him at once. She tiptoed over, reached down and pulled both guns from their holsters. As she did so, she noticed that one was a cap gun and the other a water pistol. Why, she told herself, these people are just like little children playing at being cowboys. Suddenly the sheriff awoke and stood up as if shot. Penny knew exactly what to do. She shoved one of the guns in his back. Put him up, she said. I got you covered. The sheriff's hands shot to the sky. You got the drop on me, partner, he said, admiration in his voice. One false move and you're dead, Penny said, grateful that she had read Lucy Lawless, Girl Wrestler. March, she said, pointing at the cell but the sheriff refused to move. It's my bounden duty to defend my sacred office with my life, he said. It sounded as if he'd memorized it. Penny didn't know quite what to do. Then she noticed the sheriff's hands were trembling. Think of your wife and children, she said. You're right, ma'am, said the sheriff, much relieved, and allowed himself to be herded into the cell. Only when he was securely locked up did he look confused. But I've got no wife and children, he complained. Too bad, said Penny, locking the cell securely. And then, because she had a kind heart, she went over to the pile of comic books, selected several, and gave them to the green sheriff. Thank you, ma'am, he said. That's right neighborly of you. 
You're a real gentleman for a rustler. All right, Polly, Penny whispered. She always seemed to be whispering, she thought to herself. Let's get out of here. She tucked him securely under her arm and started for the entrance of the cave, sliding along the wall and keeping in the shadows as she had seen the good guys do on TV. If somebody else entered, Penny meant to surprise him. And sure enough, somebody else did enter. Another green man with weirdly mottled features and shiny white teeth. To her horror, Penny saw that he was carrying Earless Osdick by the neck. Indeed, the little cat seemed near strangulation. Penny knew what she had to do. She stepped out of the shadows behind the green man and shoved her gun in his back. Reach, partner, she said in a deep voice. I've got you covered. One move and you're dead, hombre. She tried to put as much force into her words as possible, but to her dismay, they had no effect at all. That doesn't fool me, she heard the green man say. It's a toy gun and it won't even work. Put it down. And as he spoke, he turned fiercely toward her, his fists clenched and his eyes menacing. Penny dropped the gun with a clatter and shrank back against the wall.